Hey guys, my name is Sam and welcome to Prep Medic. This week's video, we are discussing opiate overdoses and Narcan administration. There's so much misinformation out there about opiates and opiate overdoses specifically. So in this week's video, I wanna talk about the signs and symptoms of an opiate overdose, as well as what you can do about it. Now this video applies to both EMS personnel and uh, civilians that might just come across someone, but I am going to break down some of the more complex concepts into kind of more digestible bits. So I'm not gonna take a deep dive into the pathophysiology. All of that being said, let's get into it. In the medical field, we generally use opiates to treat severe pain and we give it almost daily on the ambulance. Now, these medications are very safe when they're in that controlled environment. We can still have overdose situations on the ambulance when we're giving these medications in intentionally, just because everybody's body reacts differently to the medications, people have different tolerances, and we don't always guess weights correctly when we're dosing the medication. However, they're far less common. Now, in the illicit side of the house, we have a lot more potential for overdose, simply because the doses are not well regulated. Now, a lot of opiate abuse will start with chronic pain and somebody prescribed the medications and that can escalate uh, from there. That's not a hard and fast rule, but that is one way people become addicted to these medications. So they might start with legitimate pills or something they're taking at home, and then it might escalate to things like heroin or illicit fentanyl. When you get into the illicit medications that are coming from a drug dealer, you have no guarantee of the dose. It's a lot more common to overdose on these medications on that illicit side. Now, the other part of that, and the sad part is, is that because it is an illegal medication to take without a prescription, there's oftentimes a reluctance to call 911 and call emergency services to that person because people don't wanna go to jail, which is pretty understandable. So how do you recognize an opiate overdose? First and foremost, you're going to see CNS depression. This is an altered mental status. The patient is usually unresponsive. Next, you're probably going to see respiratory depression of some kind. This could be full on respiratory arrest where they are no longer breathing or it might just be very, very long, slow respirations and the patient is not able to oxygenate their blood. Secondary to that, you might see cyanosis, so that's blueness around the lips uh, or the fingernail beds. As it progresses, that will get more and more pronounced. You might see pinpoint pupils. And lastly, hypotension, although hypotension is sometimes hard to assess in these hyperemergent situations. So really quick, let me dispel just a little bit of misinformation. Fentanyl is not going to kill you if you see it, if you touch it, if it's in the air, it's simply not going to cause an overdose. There's a lot of studies that have disproved this myth over and over and over again. And no, carfentanil is no different. It will not react any different in your body. I've done a couple videos on that. I'll leave it up here, or whatever, wherever the tag uh, appears. And then I'll leave some resources down below because I know people aren't gonna believe me here. The American College of Clinical Toxicologists has a great position statement that cites a lot of different studies on this that has completely uh, debunked the myth of passive exposure from fentanyl. So I will say that standard precautions still apply. So you still should wear you know, gloves and uh, eye protection at the very least. A mask never hurts if you're doing any kind of resuscitation effort on a patient. There are more pathogens than just some contact fentanyl out there and it's just good to protect yourself. Again, though, if you don't have gloves, that shouldn't stop you from acting, in my opinion. So lastly, let's talk about how you treat an opiate overdose. There's a lot of myths on this as well. You know, people say, get them in a hot shower, get them in a cold shower. I've heard everything under the sun to stop an overdose. Now, the definitive treatment, the antidote for opiates is going to be Narcan administration, but there's a lot of things that lead up to Narcan administration that we need to talk about first. So the primary cause of death in an opiate overdose is going to be respiratory arrest, where they stop breathing, they're not oxygenating their organs, and they go into cardiac arrest, they die. In this case, we can stop that without any Narcan by providing rescue breaths. Now, me personally, I'm not going to do mouth to mouth uh, on somebody you know that I don't know out on the street. There's a lot of nasty pathogens out there and that is a risk to me. However, if you have a barrier device of some kind, if you have a bag valve mask, uh, if, if you have some simple airway adjuncts, you know everybody out there carrying an IFAC, if you have a nasal pharyngeal airway, secure that airway and provide rescue breaths if you can do that safely. Now, if it's a family member, you know, if grandma took too much of her uh, morphine for her back pain and she's not breathing and you feel comfortable doing mouth to mouth, you absolutely can. But rescue breaths are kind of their own thing and we're not gonna go through that here. I have another video uh, on rescue breaths and airway management down below. So start breathing for the patient if you can. This is going to correct that hypoxia. It's gonna start evening out their blood gas. So when they do 
wake up, even if you have Narcan, they're gonna be a lot happier. Once we've secured that airway, once we've started breathing for that patient, we're going to go to Narcan. Now, if we have no means of breathing for that patient, if we only have Narcan at our disposal and our only other option is mouth to mouth, going straight to Narcan is acceptable, but there are some risks that we're gonna talk about down the road. So Narcan is an opiate antagonist, which basically means it binds to the opiate receptor site and stops the opiate from being able to bind and react with the body. So in this case, Narcan comes in a lot of different forms. The most common one you're going to see kind of on the street is going to be this nasal spray. It looks like an allergy spray that you stick up their nose and you spray it right there. It has instructions on the box. Uh, you can also get Narcan, like this is the more professional form. Uh, this is what we carry you know, on the ambulance and, and the helicopter. And in these cases, um, this can be given in a variety of different ways. So we can give it internasal with a MAD device. This is a mucosal atomizer, de atomizing device, and this is going to spray a mist into their nose. Really easy to do, it's instantaneous. You get that going, you put it up their nose and you do it. You don't need any IV access or anything. If you don't have a MAD device or if it's not in your protocol, you can give Narcan a variety of other ways. You can give it IV. So if you have an IV established, you can push it in the IV. You can give it IM intramuscular. You can even give it down an endotracheal tube. I think my old, old textbook said, although I'd never uh, recommend that. So it can be given pretty much any route there is. So the general dose for Narcan is between 0.4 and 2 milligrams. And there's a lot of different schools of thought on how we dose this. You can start with the low conservative end and start giving 0.4 milligrams up until that two milligram point to see if they react to it, titrate to breathing. This is oftentimes safer for the provider. It's a little bit more friendly to the patient because you're not just getting rid of everything right away. Uh, a lot of providers will say that if you give two milligrams right off the bat, it can cause them to like come up really, really angry and swinging. Now, some of this I'm going to branch into anecdotes, so I want you to take this with a grain of salt. In my experience, when it comes to somebody that's having an opiate overdose, if you have a calm environment, if you've treated hypoxia and hypercarbia, that's too much CO2 uh, in their circulation, before you give Narcan, even if you give two milligrams, they will come up in a much better move. If we're not treating hypoxia and we're just pushing this right away, there's going to be a period of time where they're still altered, but you've removed the opiate from their system and it's going to cause problems. Uh, when it comes to a lot of these nasal sprays that you can get at the pharmacy, these will oftentimes be like a single dose. And I've seen anywhere between two milligram doses per spray and four milligrams. Always follow the instructions on those. So side effects and adverse reactions of Narcan. Honestly, these are pretty minimal. Most of the side effects and adverse reactions we see with Narcan are a result of other factors. Like we just talked about, one of the things people say is, hey, you're ruining their high, they're gonna come up mad. And they might. But like I just said, if you have a good environment around them, you don't have people escalating the situation, they can come up very calmly. You do have to be aware though that they might become violent and you have to defend yourself in those situations or get out of that situation as fast as you can. Now, the other kind of adverse reactions I've heard thrown about, people will say if you give it too fast, you could cause flash pulmonary edema. The literature on this is pretty minimal, um, and that coupled with my own anecdotal experience of giving this medication for years to probably hundreds of people, um, I've never seen it. So it's a very, very slim chance of uh, that happening. Other than that, it can cause a pretty severe headache, and there's always a risk of an allergic reaction. Any medication we give has risks to it, and we shouldn't just be giving it willy-nilly. Now, I will say Narcan can be used as a differential diagnosis. If you have a patient that's unresponsive, we're not sure why we're kind of going through our options for what that might be, you can give Narcan as a trial. It is a relatively safe medication to give. As a general rule of thumb, if a patient can ask for Narcan, they probably don't need, need Narcan. If you are an EMS provider and you gave, hey, a little bit too much fentanyl to somebody, you know, the little old lady with the broken hip, you gave her 50 mics and now her O2 sat is starting to dip down. Generally speaking, Narcan's not going to be the drug of choice for you simply because you've given that narcotic for that severe pain. I'm gonna give Narcan and now that patient's gonna be in just as much pain as they were up front, and now I can't give them anything as, as far as opiates go. So in these cases, oftentimes just stimulating them, telling them to take a deep breath, applying supplemental O2 is going to be the best course of action for you. I wanna leave you with a couple things, and I don't wanna beat a dead horse, but first and foremost, if you have any preconceived notions of addicts or what causes this, please get them out of your head. It has no place in patient care. We have to approach all our patients 
um, with kind of the professionalism we approach anybody else. And I know people have a lot of different opinions on addiction, but especially as professional providers, it's not our job to judge them. Second is make sure you have a calm environment, a safe environment for that patient to come to, but also make sure that you have uh, your protection plan for yourself uh, in place in case things go wrong. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below and I will see you next week.